Redford. I'm Bob Woodward of the Washington Post. Mr. Markham, are you here in connection with the Watergate burglary? I'm not here. Hoffman. Hi, uh, this is Carl Bernstein of the Washington Post, and I was just wondering if you can remember... All the President's Men. The story of the two young reporters who cracked the Watergate conspiracy. They stumbled into lead. They tripped over clues. This whole thing is a cover-up. It's right on our nose. And piece by piece, they solve the greatest detective story in American history. It's ticklish business any way you look at it. Come on, we'll stick together. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Ticklish Business. I'm Kristen Lopez, joined by Emily Edwards once again. Emily, how are you? I am so well. I'm excited for today's movie. I could not be more in agreement, but I feel like we are just going to be spending this being super paranoid. We did our last episode on In the Heat of the Night, which was all about racism and murder. And now we're talking about paranoia and Nixon so that should be fun. We're talking about 1976's All the President's Men. We are joined by a fantastic guest, Mike White of the Projection Booth Podcast. Mike, how are you? I'm doing great. Thank you so much for having me today. I am so excited that you agreed to want to talk to us about Alan Pakula and this specific film. For people that don't know who you are or the podcast that you do, you want to shout it out and give a little background? I've been doing it for about 12 years now. Every week we come up with a new episode where we look at one particular film, dive into the history of it, the placement and culture that it fits. Try to talk to some folks behind it if we can. Just generally have a good time discussing movies. It's one of my favorite things to do. If you've not listened to Mike's podcast, you should. We heartily endorse it setting the bar high for us over at Ticklish Biz all the time. But before we get into all the President's Mad, we'd like to briefly remind everyone that if you haven't checked out our Patreon at patreon.com slash ticklishbiz, you should. We do additional bonus pods, including double features, looking at remakes, based on a true podcast, looking at biopics and true crime. Emily Edwards and I are going to be embarking on an ambitious miniseries looking at classic film literary adaptations it's called the Have You Read the Book, the series, but we are not actually reading the books. Should still be fun anyway. We also give out regular care packages and movies and gifts and let you guest on an episode. That's at patreon.com slash ticklishbiz. And don't forget, Emily and I are authors. You can order our books wherever you get books. And our Redbubble store has some fabulous art, all designed by our newlywed, she will be in a couple weeks, Samantha Ellis, featuring your favorite stars, including our popular Makoko mugs. You can find that at ticklishbiz.redbubble.com. And if you are in the Los Angeles area on August 27th, Ticklish Biz has been selected by the American Cinematheque as part of their Friend of the Fest event. I will be there at the Los Feliz 3 on August 27th at 1 p.m. in person. Emily and Samantha will be there virtually, which is going to be really fun. I cannot wait to see how they work that out. If you guys are going to be on the big screen, we are going to be introducing my favorite John Garfield movie of all time, 1939's Four Daughters. And I promise it might get weird. You can buy tickets through the American Cinematheque website. We would love to see all of our Ticklish Business LA fans come out and celebrate 1939, John Garfield, the fact that I hate Jeffrey Lynn in that movie. A lot of feelings, a lot of feelings. And I'm sure Emily has not seen it. I'm excited for her to watch it. I have not. It's going to be fun. I'm so excited. I love seeing movies that you all have very strong opinions about, and I go into them completely blind. That is coming up August 27th at 1 p.m. at the Los Feliz 3 here in Los Angeles. Let's talk about Alan Pakula's All the President's Men. Before we get into the weeds of all of the movie that we're dealing with here, this is the story of how Bob Woodward and Carl Bernstein, reporters for The Washington Post, played by Robert Redford and Dustin Hoffman, respectively, uncovered Nixon's Watergate scandal. I have seen this movie several times. I was fortunate to see this about a month ago over at the Academy Museum, apparently in a screening that Timothy Chalamet was in, but I did not see him. So very upsetting. It's one of the great journalism movies. As a journalist, this is viewing 101 next to like 
Shattered Glass. Those are the two journalism movies that they show you when you embark on this career, question mark. I had always known of it. I had seen it a couple of times, but watching it on a big screen at the Academy, especially in 2023, with our political structure being what it is, oh, it hits differently in so many ways. I appreciate the fact that when we talk about movies that could not be remade today, we usually pick bad faith arguments like Blazing Saddle. I don't think you could make all the president's men today. I really don't. Mike, what do you think about the movie? Well, it's funny because in preparation for this, I watched The Post, the Steven Spielberg movie from a few years ago, which is almost a prequel to this. They literally end with the Watergate burglary. The Post doesn't have the same emotion that this movie has. It doesn't have the same investigative feel for it. It doesn't have the whole idea of just how high this goes. What I like about all the president's men is that they think it's just this small story and it starts getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And now in 2023, to your point, it feels like we are in such mire that of course it goes up to the president. Naturally, we're going to lean that way of just don't think of this as a small story. We just immediately jump to the big, big picture. So yeah, I don't know if they could do this. And plus who uses a phone book and goes through the painstaking process of this journalism. That's what I really like about this is the process. A lot of people that don't know how journalism works need to see this movie because even though the use of the press and things have changed, we've gone from typewriters to computers, nothing is really printed in the same way, and journalistic standards have vastly changed. The basic tenets of that are still there in terms of watching Ben Bradley throughout this whole movie tell them, you guys don't have the story. You need to do more work. You need to do more. And people are surprised by like, but but we all know, right, you know, in hindsight that they had stuff, but it's about proving that you have all of these unimpeachable facts. Emily, what was your background with this? What do you think of it? I'd actually seen it before. This is the first movie that I'm discussing that I've actually already seen, and possibly because it's not 70 years old, it's only 50 years old. I also went through J school, so I totally understand that sort of pressure. And print deadlines, remember those? Remember when they used to tell you how to calculate column inches? That's how old I am when they told you what size font you were going to get and you had to take layout classes. I used to learn the software. We I don't miss software. This. I don't miss it at all. It was horrible, but it is such an odd blast from the past to watch Robert Redford and Dustin Hoffman do things that I learned about in college in the early 2000s. So consider that when you consider how much digital media has changed the journalism landscape. It's such an incredible movie because you are right that this is the ultimate journalism is going to save us movie. And it makes you feel really, really good. And then the movie goes off and you're living in 2023. And then you feel slightly less good about it. But I love this movie. Robert Redford is amazing in this movie. Jason Robards is amazing in this movie. Dustin Hoffman is really, really good in this movie. And I have things to say about that later on when we discuss. It's just a great movie. It is an innocent but not innocent movie. And I love it. I love it so much. What makes Pakula such an iconic and yet underrated director at the same time is that most people know his Paranoia trilogy, which it's this, it's the Parallax view, and I forget the third. Clute. Clute. Oh my god, how did I forget Clute? I kept wanting to say Three Days of the Condor, and I don't think that's him. Everybody remembers that trilogy of films. The 1970s now gets a lot of stuff in hindsight of in amongst all the hippies and the free love and the second wave feminism is this era of government mistrust. That's what I find really interesting watching this today versus even in the, like, the late 90s, early 2000s, is that that concept of government mistrust has only intensified in the last decade or so. The concept of the president in this movie bugging government offices just seems quaint. It just seems quaint now. It just seems very, very, oh, that's it. And yet, 
What I always forget every time I watch this movie is that this film only deals with the first seven months of the Watergate scandal. Spoiler alert, it does not end with Nixon going down. You get the TV talking about stuff that happens after, but you don't get the payoff of seeing Woodward and Bernstein high five each other because they got the president out. It really is just this lead up. And you would not think that a movie about a bunch of dudes typing and interviewing people would be interesting enough to sustain a two hour movie. But it very much is. It's like a play. And that's really what Pakula was a master at, was taking actors, at least in two movies, actors that were very underrated in terms of their talents, Redford and Warren Beatty in The Parallax View, and giving them such depth. Now, I joke about watching this movie for Bob Redford in the elbow patches. He wears a lot of corduroy. He is fine as hell. So much corduroy. He really does get such a meaty role in this film, but then he's blown out of the water by Dustin Hoffman, who I think gets more scenes. There's a lot of different threads in that. It all goes to the fact that Pakula really is a director that I don't ever think really got his flowers for what he was able to do with the films that he made. I know Pakula and I know his work, and I don't know if he got as much credit as he deserves, but he definitely deserves a lot. And I've heard him get a lot of praise. I mean, these three films are huge when it comes to paranoia, conspiracy. It's like starting back in early 60s, if not 50s. I mean, the whole, what was it that Eisenhower was warning us about? Basically, the government and the army in cahoots together and the military industrial complex. I can't believe I forgot that term. But he's warning us about that as he's about to leave office. And then we've got Kennedy and the assassination. And that really helps set the tone of the country pretty much to where we're at today. And there have been little bright spots in between. But you're right. This is very quaint to be like, oh, he was bugging offices. And he had these people that were writing little letters about his opponent. Okay, that's great. As opposed to, let's have the Russians hack the other person's stuff. And plant all these horrible memes out there and let's take over Facebook and Twitter and all social media and try to completely tear down the other person's reputation. We'll say that they drink the blood of children and there's a whole cabal of pederasts and they all meet in a basement at a pizza parlor. What? (laughs) Having this type of, oh yeah, he won the election as opposed to, no, he wouldn't refuse to give up the election and had an armed insurrection instead. Okay, great. Yeah, it's very, very quaint with this. And I agree with you. It is interesting that they end it where they end it, but I really like where they end it. And I like that it feels like this is the first step in that path to all of those teletype headlines that we have at the end. I really appreciate that. And I appreciate too seeing the dates and how quickly all those dominoes start to fall afterwards. This is, movie is coming out right as this stuff is happening, you know, right afterwards. I'm really hoping over the next couple of years, we get to see a lot of great movies about all of the stuff that we've been through for the last few years, especially with what's going on right now with all of the indictments coming down. It's amazing to realize that Nixon resigned In August of 74, he was pardoned in September of 74 when Ford came into office. This movie came out just two years later. We talk about timeliness in films and timeliness. It's such a difficult needle to thread because how many COVID related films and TV shows did we get within the first six months to a year? Nobody wants timely while we're in it. We don't need a direct response because you don't know how things are going to go. But you also want a movie to come out years after the fact and either nobody cares or it maybe benefits you because you have the ability of hindsight to look at things from a different perspective. But this is just coming two years after everything was really said and done. That's amazing that it could be as frank as it is with so many things, which is just shocking to think about. It really hits timely in the right way. I just love the expression of just sweaty, hard work that this movie shows. 
First of all, going back to the corduroy, that man wears a corduroy suit in DC in the summer. Who is doing that? What kind of mania do you have? How sweaty are you? But it also shows just how incredibly dogged and determined they must have been to track this down. You can tell that the movie is not necessarily about, it's not about Nixon. It's about the guys who are taking them down. And the movie is not about the conspiracy. It's about the determination and the sense of what is right and the sense of print journalism being black and white about delivering facts. That is something that certainly gets missed in a lot of more modern movies about journalism, where they're like, we're chasing the story and we're going to get the bad guy almost like a superhero, whereas this is about the hard graft of journalism. And I really, really appreciate that. And I think that's something that Pakula does really well also with Clute, where it's you're discussing people being poisoned and the conspiracy behind it, whereas it's less so much about the bad guy, but the person going through the motions to get the bad guy. And that is something that I find really, really valuable in movies and really, really valuable in the depiction of massive crime and corruption. It's not necessarily the joy of the final denouement of taking down the bad guy. It's the process to get there. And I really, really, really like that about this movie. It is so much about the process. And so much of this movie reminds me of a detective movie. Just the way that we have Woodward and Bernstein at times are almost good cop, bad cop when they're talking with some of these people. And they're trying to get this information out of them, trying their best to do this. The scene of... Hoffman, when he goes to the one person and her sister is giving him coffee and he's just drinking, he says 20 cups of coffee and he's just trying to get that information out of her the way that he's saying, okay, well, just give me initials and just trying to figure out from the initials what's going on. Just that way that they even will run down, well, I'm going to say this and then you say that and then we can get our confirmation that way because it's like, the detective story, but one extra layer, because not only do you get the clues, but then you have to get the confirmation of the clues from at least two sources, if not more. And the way that they do those things, all right, I'm going to count to 10. And if you're still on the phone, by the time I'm done, that means I'm okay with this story. All these coded things that they have to do because they won't get people to go on the record. I love that. I love the process. Like you're saying, the process of journalism. But for me, it's like the process of a private detective just out there beating the street, going through that list, that creep list of all those names and trying to figure out like, all right, you know, how about this person? How about that person? When they get the one person and they, and she starts to open up and talk and then they realize, oh, this is the wrong Mrs. Abbott or whatever it was. It's like, oh, (laughs) it's so disappointing. And you just feel for them so much. Bernstein is really noir. He's totally open to subterfuge. He's totally open to lying to people. He's totally open to not obfuscating the fact that he works for the Post, but he's telling them not truths in order to get them to say things, to open up, to break his story. Whereas you have pure Labrador retriever Robert Redford most of the time just saying like, oh, we won't pressure you to go hook up with your ex in order to get information that we want. He's a little bit more Superman in the sort of I'm going to fight for truth and justice in the American way, in a very Robert Redford way. It's two mystery movies together, two mystery movie tropes together in these two character depictions. And it's brilliant. They fight, but in a way that is totally believable. And they're just dynamite together. Their first scene together, when he takes the one story, Bernstein takes the story and starts to rewrite. He's like, yeah, it was good, but mine is better. I just love that back and forth that they have there. And to your point, the two parallel stories to have the darker Dustin Hoffman, the Jewish Dustin Hoffman as Bernstein, and then have that ultimate boy scout of Robert Redford as Bob Woodward. I love the dichotomy of that and the way that they play off of each other, just that they have the blonde and the brunette. We talk about the film noir and you've always got the dark woman and then the pure woman. I mean, it's basically like that, but with Woodward and Bernstein, and then playing off some of the best character actors that have ever walked the face of the earth. Jack Warden, Martin Balsam, Kristen mentioned Jason Robards before. There's a reason why Robards won an Oscar for this movie. That last scene with him, you get chills watching it. 
Yeah, this has a stack cast. You would get, as the 1970s and 1980s would go on, you would see this really great melding of new school actors pairing up with old veterans. You do get Martin Balsam and Hal Holbrook and Jane Alexander is here in a really great sequence with Hoffman. Pre, I think, Kramer versus Kramer, when they were paired back up again in a very different ways. Ned Beatty's in there. Pre, disgraced, Seventh Heaven to star Stephen Collins is in here and just like a weird little side character. F. Murray Abraham. I could just go through the list of names of people. But it's amazing that we're talking about them as detectives because this really is a fascinating time, the late 70s post-Watergate where journalists were considered the law. They were the independent free press, right? They were the ones that were holding people to account more so than actual law enforcement was, which it's funny that I'm going to keep bringing up Three Days of the Condor because I feel like Three Days of the Condor is a great movie, but it just came out just a little bit too early because it came out in 75 and it's Sidney Pollack. That is a similar film where Robert Redford's character is playing a shadowy CIA operative there's a murder he's trying to investigate it but the end of that movie and i'm paraphrasing ends with him and cliff robertson having this exchange about how this is going to go out in the press and it doesn't matter if i can't get you rich guy because i'm gonna get my law and order by making sure it's printed and it's going to the masses that holds such weight more than actually being held accountable by a cop arresting you and taking you to trial It feels quaint compared to today, but what strikes me about watching this coming out in 76 is that as Watergate started to recede in the public consciousness mind, it would change a little bit and people would start to lampoon it. The way I learned about Watergate as a 90s kid was in 1999 when Kirsten Dunst and Michelle Williams were in the film Dick, which is a great movie if you've not seen it, but it's the Watergate story. And it was like, what if Deep Throat, the Hal Holbrook character in the film that is their source, were actually two teenage girls? The humor of that movie is that Watergate is actually a really stupid crime that somebody got caught for. Look at how dumb it is. Two teenage girls get involved and that's how it works out. That showcases what has changed about the political sphere. In 99, we had our own scandal, Clinton administration. Things start to change as the government and our response to that starts to change. And I can only imagine the films, like Mike, you were saying, that are going to come out in the next decade, two decades, looking back at this now, where it's just like, are we going to get our comical dick level type of telling of recent events? Or is it going to be an all the president's men thing where you get the realities of that story? One thing I wanted to point out really quickly is that this movie opens with the real guy who discovered the Watergate break-in, Frank Wills. I urge everybody to watch the Star series Gaslit, which is also about Watergate. It's not a great series, but they do an episode devoted to Frank Wills, who was the guy who discovered the Watergate break-in, was proclaimed a hero for a very brief moment in time. And then the narrative started to change and people started to think that he was involved in some way. It ruined his life. This appearance very briefly in All the President's Men was the first job he had gotten since the Watergate break-in because he couldn't find work. Starting the movie with the story of very briefly this person that was considered a real-life hero for a very short amount of time and his downfall, if you actually research, that always stands out to me because I doubt audiences in 76 would have known what happened to that person. If you do any bare modicum of research after that now, you realize like, oh, that's great that they put him in the movie, but realistically, his life was ruined by the whole thing. Kind of sounds like the Richard Jewell of his day. Where's that movie? I would watch that. Not directed by Clint Eastwood, though. (laughs) Yeah, let's hope that Clint Eastwood doesn't do the January 6th movie. That's really what I'm hoping. (laughs) I'm hoping that, to your point from earlier, I'm hoping that it's more like Harold and Kumar go to January 6th. That would be great. I wouldn't put it past societies. One of the things about watching this in 2023 is that you mentioned earlier, it's just the crimes are so dumb. They're dumb and simple. Even though they didn't have digital records back then, they find where the money comes so fast. It's so stupid. 
And it's really actually frustrating as a grown adult in 2023, not that they thought that they could get away with it, but that they almost did. And that's how stupid it is. And it's creating. I don't know if anybody else was watching this just going, you know, we're coming at it from the benefit of hindsight and living through things that are so much astronomically worse in the last five years, 10 years. Normally, when I see movies like this, I go, oh, how quaint. Look at those old times. And this, I'm just kind of like, I don't want to go back to the 70s because the 70s were horrible. But at the same time, it's so frustratingly dumb. I'm mad at how dumb Nixon and his cronies actually were. And John Mitchell, the former attorney general, we will need to bring him back up later on in the show. Maybe summary, because I've got things to say. That's just my overwhelming feeling when I watch this of just hooray journalists and papers that weren't apparently owned by billionaires back then. And uh, I'm so mad. Feels like Rudy does some really dumb things as well. The whole thing of butt dialing people. It feels like those are the moments that have set us apart over the last few years of did he really just say that? Did he really hold up his phone and show us his phone on TV and show us what was there? Really stupid things that feel very much like the Watergate burglar. The same bizarro cast of characters like G. Gordon Liddy. I mean, G. Gordon Liddy is he's a comic book character, but yet really walking around. And it's very similar to some of these yahoos that we have now where you're like, really? This is happening? It's amazing to me that Roger Stone has been around since back then, and he's still out there today just being the bizarro Batman villain that he wants to be. Have you joined Ticklish Biz's Patreon? You should. Just like Allie Moore, Amy Hart, Andrew Hopp, Christine Meyer, Danny, David Floyd, Donna Hill, Jacob Haller, Jonathan Watkins, Krista Painter, and Mickette. Listen to episodes 48 hours early, receive exclusive membership items, and even guest on an episode. You can also get access to bonus series like Based on a True Podcast, Doubled Features, and our new upcoming limited series, But Have You Read The? It's all at patreon.com slash ticklishbiz. Back to the show. I do love that G. Gordon Liddy is really just his own Halloween costume at this point. Because historically, we've had so many interpretations of him, and I would never believe that we'd have a world where G. Gordon Liddy has been played by Harry Shearer, Shea Wiggum, and Justin Thoreau. Never would have thought that that would be a thing that we would get. What's interesting about All the President's Men, to bring it back to this movie, is that most of those players are not in this film, for the most part. We see maybe stock footage, but... For the most part, the people that actually are involved, the names that we now know are not present. We do get the Watergate burglars, you know, McCord and Barker, but those are not the names that people remember. I think most would be very hard pressed to remember the names of the people that actually went into the Watergate building as opposed to the machinations of the people who sent them there. Watching this Not to keep comparing it to other political movies, but it's hard not to because I really think it is the gold standard. Something like JFK, very different type of story, but you have a lot of players, right? You have a lot of players, a lot of different things that you have to keep straight. What works to this film's benefit is that it doesn't really try hard to tax itself with you need to remember who this person is. It's the benefit of not having all of the big names that you would know is that Jane Alexander's character is just the bookkeeper. You know exactly her point in this thing. She controls the money. And it goes back to the whole concept of follow the money, which is what actually is not in the book on which this is based, but became the definitive phrase of the film. It actually streamlines Watergate, which is ridiculously complicated considering how simplistic it is. But this movie does a fantastic job of really simplifying the beats down to These are the people you need to know. You don't need to know exact. And and it goes towards my big hang up with films that are based on true events today that do composite characters. They just throw all these different people into one person and they give them a name. You're just like, yeah, but I know that's a fake person. Giving me someone named the bookkeeper. You know what? That pretty much says this might be based on real person could be based on a couple of people. But we're not hiding the even in the making of the film, Pakula and the screenwriters are saying 
The facts are unimpeachable. We might have taken artistic liberties here and there, but the facts are the facts, which I don't think a lot of films do as frankly today. It was interesting watching it yesterday again and being like, okay, now who is really real? Who is not here? How did this really play out? Because it feels very much like a documentary, even though we know it's very, very narrative, but it does feel like a doc at times where you're just like, okay, and then they went to this person, then they went to this person. That might not actually be true, but Goldman's screenplay to adapt real life into this and it's masterful to use the follow the money line and to create the follow the money line and just being the line from the movie, even though it didn't happen in the book. That's fantastic. This movie hits such a wonderful point of verisimilitude where it may not have been real, but it feels really real. There's so many wonderful production design moments in this where you have Robert Redford's character living in this studio apartment that's filled with newspapers. And there's nothing else but newspapers. And it tells you everything you need to know about Bob Woodward. You know, he walks in and all the secretaries are looking at Bob Woodward, even though he's only been there for nine months. But he's a wonder kid. And these are the things you need to know. My favorite detail that I caught this time around that I never caught before was that all of the phone books in the Post newsroom are stolen from hotels. They say Holiday Inn on the side. The truthiness of that, of just these guys are running on bare sticks. They have no money, but they're going to doggedly hunt down the truth. Robert Redford in those horrible corduroy suits, whereas Bernstein considers himself a little bit cooler. He shows up to work in jeans. There's these things that make it feel really real, too. If you've ever met someone who worked for a newspaper, you know that they're not living with anybody. He's dedicated to the job. And it's just got all of these wonderful truthiness details to it that, of course, if you were trying to break a tale while you're going to go meet a guy in a subterranean garage, you would go to the Kennedy Center and switch cabs there because there's just all these wonderful, if I was going to commit a crime, how would I do it sort of elements to it. It just feels so nice that this movie is so thoroughly planned out. The narrative arc is so perfect for this. Deep Throat understands that Bob Woodward is a fresh reporter and he may not entirely know what he's doing. There's a reason why he's reaching out to Woodward and not Bernstein. There's a reason why these things are happening. And Bob Woodward is kind of getting taken for a ride a little bit by Deep Throat and he knows it, but he also knows that he wants to go where the ride ends up. You trust him because he's Robert Redford. And he is such a good actor and such a movie star that you know he's going to win in the end. Dustin Hoffman's a great actor, but he's not a movie star in the way that Robert Redford is a great actor and a movie star. And so you know that this is all going to work out because Robert Redford is in charge and it feels really good while you're watching it. That caused a little bit of tension from what I read between the pair of them as this movie went on. This was Redford's passion project. He started looking into this when he was making The Candidate, and then he read the Washington Post stories while he was filming The Way We Were, which like, oh, that's juxtaposition of two very different Redfords. And he bought the rights to their book in 74. He wanted to make this movie and he hired Goldman. There's always been back and forth about how much Goldman's script is fully attributed to him. There were a lot of cooks in that kitchen. Goldman said Woodward worked with him on the script. Bernstein refused to work with him on the script. Goldman pretty much decided to throw out the second half of the book. And Redford was not happy with that first draft. So Woodward and Bernstein read it and also didn't like that. And Bernstein, who was dating Nora Ephron at the time, decided that they would write their own draft, which allegedly Bernstein was a ladies man, was like James Bond looking at different versions of the script. But there were a lot of different issues with casting. Redford wanted Pacino for this. I don't see at all, to Mike's point, you need to have Hoffman, the fact that Bernstein is Jewish against a character who is not Jewish. That does create this dichotomy of, like Emily, you pointed out, Bernstein is constantly trying to prove how cool he is. He's got open shirt collars and he can talk to ladies, tries to 
get that secretary to let him in. He's trying very hard, very hard to not come off as the stereotypical nerdy Jewish guy. Robards was always the first choice for Ben Bradley, but they pretty much looked at all sorts of people, including Carl Malden and Leslie Nielsen, Henry Fonda, Richard Widmark. Pretty much every older actor of the 70s was considered. Redford and Hoffman divided top billing. Redford is billed above Hoffman in the posters and trailers. Hoffman is billed above Redford in the film itself, like they did in The Man Who Shot Liberty Valance. But I had always read that there was definitely a little bit of a divide between the two of them because this was Redford's film. He was the one that had put it together and Hoffman was just an actor. He's just supposed to act. That animosity, whether real or imagined, does benefit both of the characters. Hoffman did a lot of great stuff in the late 70s into the 80s. Kramer versus Kramer is problematic as I find that film. He is really good in it. He had a real streak in that time period. But watching him here in that sequence with Jane Alexander, where he's just like shaking his knee, the little ticks. We don't talk about stage business because I don't really think in the grand scheme of CGI Marvel stuff, you're not really looking at what actors' hands are doing when they're working nowadays. And it's something I really love about classic film is that you could really watch somebody do something completely off cuff and you're like, is that scripted? Not really clear. Hoffman and Redford really do a lot of little bits of business. There's a sequence where Redford's on the phone with a guy and he gets his name wrong. And that actually was a real thing that Redford botched the line and they just kept it to show that Woodward is really hell bent on trying to get this right. He's nervous. He's got a scoop. I love that. That is something that, not to disparage contemporary films, but is not as prevalent as it was back then. The way that he will keep saying hello when he's talking with people on the phone, if they're not responding fast enough, he's just like, hello, hello, you know, just hurry up, get back to me on these answers. That is his way of pressuring people as opposed to Carl Bernstein with his way of pressuring people. I was really glad we never got the scene in there where it's, oh, Bob Woodward, you're so great and everybody loves you. And I've just been the schlub all my life. And I try twice as hard as everybody else to be this great journalist. I'm glad we don't have that stuff going on between our main characters that they do have that tension, but it's never so explicit where you're like, okay, we're going to stop the movie right now. And all this Nixon stuff can go to the side. We're just going to be two actors going at it. No, everything is in service of the story. And that's what I really like about this. We don't have to have those character moments that don't actually add anything to the characters. I love in the beginning when they explain who Woodward and Bernstein are to the newsroom. And you have the editors and the editor team discussing them. And most of the editors don't know who they are because not only is Woodward new, he's only been at the paper for nine months. The thing that they say about Bernstein is, weren't you going to fire that guy last week? And you have Jason Robards being just so elegant in the way that he controls his newsroom and controls his editors. And it's this level of competency that I feel like we don't give people on screen all that much anymore. Everybody has to be fallible. Everybody has to have something itching in the back of their mind. Whereas Ben Bradley, the character walks in and he says, I am the editor in chief or in charge of the Washington Post. I don't make mistakes. And that sort of coolness, that elegance, that wonderful sort of I am in charge and completely unflappable really makes you understand the foundation on which Woodward and Bernstein are working. Of He says it's not that he doesn't want them to break the story. He wants them to break it properly. And that is just this really beautiful undercurrent of this, of Ben Bradley's basically saying, I just want you to report it correctly. It's stunning. It is a stunning bit of, of work from Jason Robards. She realized why Robards, Lauren McCall married him, huh? The one time that Jason Robards gets flustered when he opens up the door and shouts out, Woodstein! They're so far away, but yet they can hear him and they get up and you get that long shot of them walking from the distance. And I love how we use space in this movie, walking from the distance, walking all the way to his office. We don't cut, but that is one single take. And I love that. And I love the way that Pakula is using architecture to show 
just how powerless these two characters are when they are first in the library and you get the camera pulling up above them and above them and above them. Or, or Emily, I think you mentioned the Kennedy Center when he goes there. And you, the way that buildings are so big in this world in Washington, and these are just two little guys that are set against the machinations of Washington, these edifices of power. I just love that we are shooting it this way to show just how tiny these guys are and what monster they're trying to topple. Similarly, one of the things that stood out to me while watching it this time was when they are going to the Library of Congress, and the only other people there are a school group. And it reminds you of the way that we're taught about government. It's very separated. You learn about it in school, and then you just never think of it again. You never think about the Library of Congress and what it does and what it's there for, what services it serves to the actual government of people trying to dig up dirt on other people that they're working with and trying to come up with all of these details. You think about it in the, I went there on a field trip when I was in the seventh grade. And to juxtapose these two lines of little girls like Madeline books running out of the Library of Congress and goofing off because they're bored, while there's two men there ready basically to take down the government with a library. It's such a wonderful way of showing the dynamism of government and how we interact with it. And it's just so cool. I've been saying that this movie is just an absolute tribute to the hard graft of journalism, but I'm not sure if you guys have ever heard of a documentary about Martha Mitchell, who was the wife of John Mitchell, the attorney general. Now, Martha Mitchell, I'm just going to geek out for a minute. Martha Mitchell was a little bit of a loud mouth when she was married to the attorney general and loved keeping the White House press corps on speed dial. She was blabbing about this while it was happening and no one was paying attention. So while we have this stunning, absolutely amazing movie about the hard graft of taking down a corrupt government, I just want to remind people, if you just listen to the AG's wife, you possibly would have cracked this way the heck faster. And that's something that I learned about after watching this movie for the first time. And I just had to sit with that feeling for a little while. Because Martha Mitchell, not necessarily my favorite person in the world, but she suffered quite a bit because she didn't want Nixon at all to get away with this. She was kidnapped. She was beaten. She was disappeared for a little while. And these were the kinds of mafia tactics that these guys were pulling. And meanwhile, you have Woodward and Bernstein, who if they had picked up the phone when she called them, maybe could have broken this a little bit faster. It's such an interesting thing to now again look at it in hindsight to know these things. And it's just a really, really fascinating way of looking about how journalism actually works and where they look to, whereas they could have just called up someone who was sharing a bed with someone who was involved in this, and they didn't. And so there's just this really interesting historical perspective that we get now, 50 years after the fact, that I just would love people to go and do a little bit more research and watch other documentaries about Watergate to know what was happening at the time, and it was nothing good. I love that little bit with John Mitchell and just that it's uh, John Randolph doing the voice is fantastic. And he's just a voice on the phone. The way that they are like, oh, well, we're doing this story. And he takes it and he just runs with it and he basically confirms everything that they're trying to confirm because he's a jerk and just is so mad about things. And nobody can lose their temper like John Randolph can. I would also say, again, another shameless plug for Gaslit, which is actually the Martha Mitchell story. With Julia Roberts. I want to touch on the Oscars because we talk about the Oscars getting it wrong, and that might have been the case here. This was nominated for several awards that year. It won four of them. It won sound, art direction, set decoration, Goldman script, and Jason Robards. It was also nominated for picture, Jane Alexander's supporting performance, Pakula's direction, and film editing. No Redford, no Hoffman, which is surprising in the grand scheme of things. This was nominated for Best Picture alongside Rocky, Network, Bound for Glory, and Taxi Driver. Does anybody want to hazard a guess at what beat this for Best Picture? What was the most innocuous out of all those movies? 
if you said Rocky, you would be correct because oh, that okay. was the right. best picture win. Rocky's great, but all the president's men? I don't know about that. changed culture. <laughs> Which one for the better? I don't know. <laughs> I know. And if you're curious, if we wanted to include Hoffman or Redford, you could say which one you would want to. You would have to get rid of either Peter Finch for Network, Giancarlo Giannini for Seven Beauties, Sly Stallone for Rocky, De Niro for Taxi Driver, or Bill Holden for Network. Emily, do you feel that Redford or Hoffman deserves an arm? And if so, who would you put and who would you kick out? I can't say who. Who I would kick out because I probably haven't seen any of those movies except for Rocky, to be honest with you. I'm the world's worst co-host of a classic cinema podcast. I feel like Dustin Hoffman probably did better acting, but since this is Robert Redford's movie, he would have been more likely to have gotten some kind of nomination or accolade for it. They probably couldn't figure out in the politics of the studio which one to bump further because I imagine Dustin Hoffman probably would have had words if he was not the chosen one. That's a bummer. I can't remember which movie it was, if it was Kramer versus Kramer or which film it was where Hoffman did get nominated. And I think he even won and went up and was just like, this is such a farce. The Oscars are just a big nothing burger. We all work so hard. How dare you say that I'm better than Jack Lemmon or this person or this person. I'm like, okay, yeah. So I don't know who I would kick out because all of those performances were really terrific. And I'm a big Rocky fan, so I would have definitely kept Stallone in that running. They just have to add another one because I think all of those performances were terrific. Hoffman, he had had a nomination the year before for Lenny. He had also been nominated in 70 and 68, but he wouldn't win until 1980 for Kramer versus Kramer. And then he would also win again for Rain Man. I don't really know how I feel about that last one, but whatever. As for me, I would actually have nominated Hoffman. I can see the question of who do you nominate and the split, but I would have definitely nominated Hoffman. And if I had to be a jerk to kick someone out, I'm sorry, Giancarlo Giannini, I would have probably knocked him out. In case anybody's curious who actually won. Seven Beauties is so good. Seven Uh, Beauties is a wonderful film. Oh, you have to see it. Yeah, it's terrific. The Oscar that year went to Peter Finch posthumously, got it for Network. So let's remember, this year had two nominees and lead actor for the same film. All the President's Men, it is definitely an example of a film that just, really looking at all of the nominees that we just said from the 75-76 Oscar year, this and Network are just two of the best films about media, whether that's print media or filmed media. You could just get a fantastic look at the way we look at media today. And G's Network is, we want to talk about Timely. That movie was ahead of its time when it came out. Future episode. This movie is fantastic. I do want to throw out the ending speech by Ben Bradley, where he talks about the results of the Gallup poll. Half the country's never even heard of this. Says, well, nothing's riding on this except the First Amendment to the Constitution, freedom of the press, and maybe freedom of the country. That is a line that holds so much weight even today. The response to it in 2023, I think, is vastly different than the response might have been in 1976. Alan Pakula is great. I have seen Clute, and I've seen The Parallax View, and I think that this is probably my favorite. He is a very deliberate filmmaker. Some might call him slow, but this movie is his piece de resistance. You can't go wrong watching Robert Redford and Corduroy and Elbow Patches for two hours. Follow that up, which is him in cozy sweaters in The Way We Were, and you'll have just a really great day. Redford was a hunk. He does not hold a candle to my personal favorite of Paul Newman, but golly, were they unstoppable together. He was a hunk. For the fact that he really, really wanted this particular film to be made said quite a bit about him and what they both, but also Robert Redford, was willing to put on the line. There's a moment where um, Woodward is talking to someone and she says, I'm a Republican. And he says, I am too. And Dustin Hoffman shoots him a really dirty look. It's such a political movie for every single person that's in it. If it had bombed, if it had not been good, their lives probably would not have been the same that we knew them afterwards. This is an incredibly dangerous movie to make. 
in a time where America was incredibly divided. After this, we start getting into the Reagan eras of the conservative years and how little or how much was learned from Nixon. You really need to have the bedrock for this. If you are under 30 and listening to this, give it a watch because those of us who are over 30 and have lived through working through journalism before the era of click farming, click baity journalism, it was a different time. Things were working differently from the 70s, 80s, and 90s into the early 2000s. Journalism was a really different beast. And I'm not saying it was great. I'm not saying it was infallible. I'm not saying that they didn't cater to power and politics and things like that. Of course they did. But if you are ever concerned of why the olds are up in arms about journalism today, you have to start by watching this movie because it will give you a bedrock for why everybody's cranky now. Yeah, we've talked a lot about the performances, but the filmmaking, like I said, is just remarkable. The use of the split diopter in several scenes where we've got Woodward on the right-hand side of the screen, and we've got the rest of the office in the background, and we've got that nice split diopter or that wonderful shot at the end with the TV where we've got the inauguration of Richard Nixon going on on the left side. And then you've got the two planes of action with Woodward and Bernstein, both at their typewriters, just typing in a frenzy. There's no music in that part, though I have to say the David Shire score is remarkable throughout so much of this movie. But you've just got that inauguration speech and the sound of the typewriters. It just really takes your breath away. It's so well put together. There's a reason why this movie is still being talked about today. Let us know your thoughts on... Robert Redford and Corduroy, Oscars, All the President's Mad. Please do not send us angry political diatribes. You can email them to us at ticklishbiz at gmail.com or send them to us via all social media platforms. We are on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook by searching either at ticklish underscore biz or at ticklish biz. I want to thank Mike White once again for joining us. Mike, where can fans find your fantastic show? Where are you on the interwebs? Feel free to let them know what you got coming up. Everything that I do is available at weirdingwaymedia.com, or you can go right to projectionboothpodcast.com and check out shows there. I am running very far behind, so normally we have Sci-Fi July, but it's probably going to be Sci-Fi August. So I've got some good science fiction shows coming up. We're talking about Face Off, talking about Wizards, Blade Runner 2049, so actually talking about something somewhat contemporary. It's six years old, but you know. We mostly are dealing with things from this era when we're talking about the 70s and a lot of corduroy as well. We might not focus in on the patches as much as the hair. Thank you again so much, Kristen and Emily, for having me on here. I really appreciate this. That's going to close out this edition of Ticklish Business. As always, you can listen to us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, wherever you get podcasts. Reviews matter, so leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. Five stars should do. Please, if you are in Los Angeles on August 27th at 1 p.m., come on down to the Los Feliz 3, where me, Emily, and Samantha will be there either in person or virtually to introduce 1939's Four Daughters. We would love to see a huge turnout for that. And I promise to get weird about John Garfield. We don't mention this enough, but a couple people have asked. You can always find old episodes of the show. Our complete archive of episodes is over at ticklishbusiness.podbean.com. So you can listen to all the episodes going back to episode one. We are once again on all social media platforms. You can follow me over at therap.com. And I am on all social media apps at Kristen Lopez 88. Emily Edwards, where are you on the interwebs? I am also across all social media platforms. My username everywhere on Instagram, Blue Sky is Ms. Emily Edwards. That's MS Emily Edwards. Our Patreon helps keep the lights on at Ticklish Biz HQ and gives us chances to do new content. Like Emily and I's upcoming, we are not reading the books, but we are talking about the literary adaptation series. So consider helping us at patreon.com slash ticklish biz. And we also have books out if you would like to read either, but have you read the book 52 Literary Gems that inspired our favorite films by me or Emily's fantastic 1950s noirish Girl Friday mysteries, Viviana Valentine gets her man, Viviana Valentine, and I forget the other two names because I'm a terrible, terrible friend. But they are all available wherever you buy books and you should read them because they are a delight. 
We will be back on August 30th with a celebration of all things Peter Lawford for his centennial and to talk about the weird, weird back-to-school musical good news. Till then. Mm-hmm.